I kind of had, on this particular telecom, they were soliciting ideas for um, the exploration of uh, the neighborhood, the stellar neighborhood uh, in our galaxy, so the nearest sample of stars. And they wanted to find out a quite simple question. They wanted to know whether there were any potentially habitable planets in our local neighborhood. And this is a question you would think astronomers would know the answer to. You know, we think it'd be in a catalog somewhere. There are thousands of planets known. But in actual fact, uh, that question remains open. And it's not only open, it's also not very clear how it can be solved. Uh, so uh, towards the end of this telecon, I kind of had this little itchy idea in the back of my head. Could you do it this way? I, I had this half-baked thought. And I almost didn't say anything because everybody else seemed cleverer than I was. And they were all throwing in good ideas. And then there was this pause in the, in the stream. And somebody said, well, has anybody else got anything to add? And I almost waited and I waited. And it was just like almost drew out to a, a point where it was a little uncomfortable. I said, well, yeah, I may as well. So I threw this idea in. And it was sort of one of those little trapdoors that drags you down into a hole. And I ended up, you know, now five years later with this as one of my main research themes. And I, I'm dealing with Russian oligarchs with uh, billionaires and I get flown over to mansions and things once a year. So it's, it's kind of like a little weird trapdoor that not the normal way science proceeds. Um, so it's, it's kind of a funny little moment where things don't proceed according to applying to the you know, sober, learned society for money. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking about a part of this larger program um, from the Breakthrough Foundation, and then I'm gonna have it over to Boris, who's gonna talk about a different facet that Sydney has more recently, after my engagement, Sydney now has had, uh, through the Grand Challenges, even stronger engagement with this uh, larger theme of research. So let me just share my green. Um, okay. I'm going to trust that somebody's going to yell at me that um, this, that something's not working, that my audio is okay. So I'll, 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 I'll plow on. And if I hear somebody uh, tell me otherwise, I'll assume things aren't so good. So <clears throat> getting to know the planetary neighbors, this question, um, what are the planetary neighbors and uh, how do we find exoplanets anyway? Um, you might think when you look at these kind of fun diagrams, this is the um, a Kepler orrery where all of the known Kepler targets get put on a, onto a diagram. And they used to make these up a few years ago, but I think they've kind of given up these days because there's such a rich wealth of planets coming out of missions like Kepler now that uh, you, know, you, could, you could wallpaper your entire room with diagrams like this and still not fit them all in. Uh, as of today, I just checked, there's 4,301 confirmed exoplanets, but you could probably conservatively double that for the number of planets that are likely known out there. It's just not quite confirmed to the level they want to put in these catalogs yet. Um, so those planets come from two primary uh, detection strategies. One is, of course, uh, the radial velocity technique, which was really the first productive technique to find exoplanets. And what you see here in this little animation is that the star is getting dragged around uh, in this little um, ellipse. Uh, that represents the gravitational perturbation. So the star is really orbiting, orbiting its own center of gravity in the star planet system on some time scale. So for the Earth and the Sun, of course, that time scale is a year. Um, and that little ellipse that is being um, like the reflex motion is actually really tiny. For the Earth to drag the sun around, it's only something like 100 kilometers. Um, so you're witnessing, uh, in radial velocity, you're witnessing the Doppler shift. So that is the velocity that the star uh, is receding or coming towards the Earth. But I also want to just point out on this diagram the star is also waggling side to side on the sky. So there are two signals there that you could latch onto. Radio velocity latches onto one, which is the line of sight component, but the same motion also generates a side to side motion on the sky, and that'll come into play later on. Um, the other productive technique, and overwhelmingly the most productive these days, is a thing called um, the transit technique, 
in which we just witness quite simply the dip in starlight um, as a result of a dark object occulting a tiny part of uh, the stellar surface. So these two techniques um, are really very productive. We've got, like, like I just said, we've got now thousands of objects. Um, what's, what's wanting? What's lacking here? Why, why are we still having this conversation? Why haven't we just solved this problem already? So part of the issue is that these, um, these techniques aren't finding the kind of planets that we would like to, at least not with great efficiency. Typically, this is the kind of planet you would find with those techniques. If you think about both of those things, the radial velocity, um, what we find with radial velocity typically are heavy planets because they tug their star around to a greater degree and planets in very close orbits because the closer the orbit, the more, um, the more the rapidly the star is pulled around. So we tend to find these fiery hell worlds um, and in fact, there's a bias also with the transit technique towards more preferentially finding close orbit planets. And planets as small as Earth become very hard because the uh, shadow occultation on the surface of the star from our apparent position is quite small. So that's not what we want. We, of course, live in Sydney. Uh, we all know Sydney's all about real estate and we want something where we might find uh, a temperate world that could host life. So that's more the ticket. Um, even great in an era of COVID, we have islands so we can, we can put a moat around everything. So we're all about real estate here. We wanna find habitable zone real estate, um, planets where potentially there might be life. And in fact, astronomers uh, ahead of everyone on this game, we've already got the, the market kind of analyzed there's a, a sort of a real estate desirability index called the habitable zone. Um, and it turns out that if you pick any given star, if you pick a red dwarf star, a cool red star, you need to cuddle up close for your um, habitable zone, which is quite simply defined really as, as kind of the chemistry and the conditions to have uh, liquid water on the surface. Um, no, this is, these games are all about life as we know it. Um, life as we don't know it, you know, sort of gas blobs on Jupiter or something. Um, those are things that generally astronomers put in the too hard basket. We don't know enough about what we don't know to look for that kind of life. Um, so when we astronomers define these things, we normally stick with the known um, sphere of life. So of course, the further, for, for brighter and hotter stars, you've got to keep further away, otherwise you get baked. And uh, the habitable zone here is kind of, in fact, Earth is, is regarded now as more towards the interior edge of the habitable zone um, rather than sort of in the middle for a solar-like star. So why don't we just go out and find planets the way we always have in the past? So if you ask historically, um, of course, you know, the, the, the major planets, Venus, Mars, they've been known since antiquity just by people going out looking up. And a, a more advanced version of that, looking up with telescopes, um, pretty much discovered everything in our own solar system. So why don't astronomers just go look for these planets? What's wrong with doing that? Well, this is a famous picture from the um, uh, Voyager mission. It's called the Pale Blue Dot. You might have seen it in your lectures in first year for astronomy, but it, it, it speaks to how difficult it is to see a planet. This is a probe still in our own solar system and it was turned back by Carl Sagan. The cameras were turned back to the inner solar system to catch this picture of Earth. And you can see this tiny little fleck of light um, riding on a beam of, in fact, that's an artifact from the camera, everything else you can see on there. Very easy to miss. Somehow my, um, my slides are deciding to advance themselves here. Um, <clears throat> so even when you're in your own solar system with a space telescope, it's easy to miss these things. Here's another example of the same thing. This is um, one of the most famous astronomy images of all time from the Cassini spacecraft with Saturn in silhouette against the sun, just a stunning image. And you can see in the, maybe in the left hand, sort of upper left, you can see a tiny little fleck of light. Um, in fact, when this was first published, this image on National Ge Geographic, it was on the cover. And the uh, cover artist airbrushed that 
out. They thought that was a bad pixel on the detector. And in fact, they airbrushed out the Earth and the Moon, which you can see here. Uh, you can even see the Moon off to the side, little binary system. So this shows you how hard it is. It's, it's easy to miss things, even when you're in the same solar system. So when we look at planets in a distant solar system, um, we have these horrendously difficult technical challenges. You can see here, uh, this is our own solar system. And if you want to try and just image the planets in that solar system, the contrast ratio you require. So that's the brightness coming from the planet compared to the, the glare from the star that's really noise to you here. You want to see the planet against the noise. You've, you've got about one photon for 10 to the 10 photons from the star. Um, and in actual fact, it turns out that um, most of the planets uh, give you signals around this 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 area in reflected light. So it's a very, very daunting technical challenge uh, to try and recover imagery which has this fidelity that you can dig so far down into the noise. Um, you might say, well, let's just look for bigger planets. Um, there's a fun thing that happens when you keep piling mass onto a planet. Um, if you ask the question, how big is the biggest pile of rocks? It sounds like a question that has no answers, like how big is the biggest piece of string? It's, it can be infinite. But in actual fact, if you keep piling rocks onto other rocks, uh, at some point, the equation of state at the core of that big, heavy pile of rocks will start to break down. The rocks will start to compress upon each other from the mass of the new rock you added. And if you look at these curves here, you can see uh, if you make rocks out of iron, which is the bottom curve here, um, you, there is a maximum amount of iron. There's a maximum size and magnesium and carbon. And if we stretch our definition of what a rock can be, rocks made out of hydrogen, if we throw hydrogen into a big pile, there's actually a maximum size. So, um, and it turns out that Jupiter is actually not very far from that size. If you pile more matter on after that limit, after that peak, what happens is you put more mass on, but the more mass causes the planet to shrink by a larger factor than the volume of the rock you just added. So you add more mass, but the planet gets smaller and smaller. And of course, there are a number of ways to get out of this game down this slope of the curve. The, the, you can turn a star on down there, or you can turn into a black hole or something, but I won't go into that. So we can't really find planets because uh, by just looking for big ones, the ones we see are about as big as they get. And this is a kind of a visual for how difficult that imaging challenge is. We have um, a brightness ratio is about equivalent to one of the brightest modern searchlights or a, a lighthouse lamp. And we have a tiny glowworm crawling one millimeter away from the lamp. And we have to view that from about 20 kilometers away. And then from the Earth's surface, there's a phenomenon called seeing. The atmosphere stirs up the view. Uh, so it's a little bit like doing the whole thing on a miserable rainy night through a grimy window. And if you think I'm exaggerating, it's actually not so far from the truth. It's a, a tremendous, tremendously difficult uh, observational challenge to try and recover imagery of this kind. Um, which kind of brings me to the origins of this project. So uh, I think Boris is going to talk a little bit more about this. I won't go into Starshot, but Yuri Milner, who's um, on the left in this frame with the, um, some of the uh, people from the, the, I guess, the chairs of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation Committee, that's Freeman Dyson, Stephen Hawking, um, threw down this challenge to the community. I want to send a spacecraft to Alpha Centauri in my own lifetime. So I'll order 40 years or 50 years or something. It's kind of taken to be. Um, so this was my idea that I talked about just before. This was my moment in the telecon where uh, things changed. I threw down this idea that, well, the first thing you want to do if you are building a technology for you know, several trillion dollars. Uh, the last thing you want to do, in fact, is to fly out to Alpha Centauri and find that there's, there's no bus stop there. There's nothing to see. There is no planet uh, in that star system. So almost as a precursor mission, it's essential to survey the nearest star systems and find whether there are exoplanets present. Um, so this was the challenge. And it's kind of nice from a physics point of view to have a very clear um, challenges. 
is there an earth analogue in alpha sen? Um, and by earth analogue, we mean something about the mass of the earth, up to two or three times more massive would still be fine to host life as we know it, in a half to two year orbit, which would put it in the habitable zone. And A or B, we've got Alpha Centauri, as we'll see in a minute, is a binary star. So there's two chances to find that planet. We're not fussy about which of the binary companions the star might orbit. So here's our local, um, local sky. We're lucky to be hearing this talk in uh, Australia where we can actually go out and look up and see these things. There's a Southern Cross. Alpha Sen is there. Um, it's about four light years away and uh, is overwhelmingly the nearest sun-like star. It's in fact a double star. One of them is called Rigel Cantorus and the other one's Ptolemy in the binary pair. But it's actually a triple system with uh, a, a red dwarf called Proxima Sen, which also has a uh, exoplanet known in a habitable orbit, in fact, for Proxima Sen. I can speak more to that in the questions. The thing I want you to notice here is that 1.3 parsecs, that's the distance to that star. So it's funny though, if you go out and look at the night sky, Alpha Sen looks unremarkable, but otherwise bright star in this field. It looks the same as all the other things you're looking at. But in actual fact, if you zip around and look at some of these other things, they're not at all the same. All of these stars in the cross are a hundred times further away than Alpha Sen, um, roughly. And in fact, all of those stars, all of those other bright stars are also at about 100 parsecs, 100 times further away than Alpha Sen. So in actual fact, when you look out at the night sky, you're not looking at your neighborhood, at least the bright stars visible to the naked eye. Most of those are you know, off in the middle, far distance. You, so when we look at the night sky, um, we see the luminous cities off in the great distance. We don't see the little cottages next door. Alpha Sen being kind of an exception there. It's a bright star. Um, and in fact, it's the nearest star, it's, it's, well, counting Proxima as well. It's the nearest star system to Earth. Um, and in fact, the funny thing is, if you think about that in time, it's the nearest star system to Earth at the moment, but in another few tens of thousands of years, it won't be. Some of these other ones, Lisa 445 or Land A21185, um, normally, it's these red cockroaches, these little dim things that you can't even see with the unaided eye in the night sky that are the nearest objects. Um, so we're very, very lucky at this epoch in history to have Alpha Sen, which is a sun-like star right near us. And remember, it's life as we know it. So one of the things we're looking for is a sun-like star that hosts an Earth-like planet. Um, one of the other, for me, very fortuitous things is that Alpha Sen's a binary star. So Let's adopt Yuri Milner's challenge, the, the billionaire challenge. We need to find whether there's a planet around Alpha Sen. Well, could we use transits from Kepler or something? Well, no, that's just not going to happen because uh, the probability of finding an Earth-like planet is much less than 1%. You've got to be lucky. You've got to have that alignment where it blinks in front of the line of sight. So when you've only got one star, that's uh, not, a, um, not a way to proceed. Can we use the Doppler effect? Well, it turns out that signals become very small for um, Earth-like planets. And in particular, sun-like stars just have a noise floor that is not sufficient to get a kind of an exo-Earth. There's too much noise coming from the intrinsic stellar processes. So the last man standing here is that side-to-side -side wobble, astrometry. Um, if we watch the sun, and we were an alien civilization trying to figure out whether the sun hosted any planets. If we looked at it from the pole, we would witness the sun getting tugged around. And that locus is given here. You can see the dates on that locus. It's pulled around by its own diameter. Most of that is from Jupiter. If you take Jupiter away and Saturn away, you would see a tiny remnant left of this motion. But engraved on top of that locus, there's a little wobble way smaller than the line type on here that uh, represents the Earth. So the Earth is also tugging the sun around. Um, you'll see just how hard it is to see that uh, motion in a minute, but I'll just point out, if you want to find M dwarfs, like the local uh, red dwarf stars, then radial velocity does become 
viable. But we want these true Earth analogs. So we want a sun-like star with an Earth-like planet. And this is a little bit of a busy plot. I'll try and just extract the important point. But if hot stars are on the left in blue, cool stars are on the red in, uh, right in red, you can see the astrometry signal. So we want a nice healthy signal. We want to be towards the top of this plot. The astrometry signal is quite healthy and high for the um, FGK stars, the green ones in the middle, and it declines for the red ones. The opposite happens for radial velocity. We get a real boost in signal for planets hosted around M dwarfs, but the signal really dies down here for um, Earth-like analogs. So what we're hoping is that by looking for the side-to-side -side wobble on the sky, astrometry, not the radial velocity line of sight wobble, um, we can leverage this advantage that astrometric signals grow stronger. And if you look at all of the stars in our neighborhood with astrometry goggles on, and you say, how big's the signal I, I would get from a habitable planet, habitable Earth, Alpha Cn A and B are riding up here way high. Um, Sirius is really not viable. There's several reasons we shouldn't bother looking there. These blue ones are probably not very useful, but Alpha Cn A and B are just giving these huge signals, two micro arc seconds, three micro arc seconds. Um, and the signals decline with distance as we go out into the, the galaxy. But this is all very, very much our local neighborhood. So it turns out that with a fairly small telescope, if you look at that number we needed to get to, to one or two micro arc seconds for Alpha Cen for an Earth planet, a fairly small telescope, only 30 centimeters aperture, can actually come to that limit in a fairly short amount of time. Um, with a 30 centimeter space telescope, we only need of order for Alpha Cen A and B, we, only, we need less than an hour. We need only minutes of integration to come to a sufficient signal to noise for one micro arc second planet. So the problem with astrometry and the big Achilles heel is that when you're trying to register a side to side wobble on the sky, it's an angular change. And you need to register that against something. You need your ruler to span something. So you, you can't just expect your telescope to point perfectly. If you, it's wobbling from side to side, you need to measure that angle with respect to another fixed angle. The problem is that almost all the time, that angle is measured against the background stars and the background stars are terribly faint. They're way off to the right hand end of this plot. So even though we get enough signal to noise on our primary target in a matter of minutes, we have to wait months to get enough signal to noise on the reference stars in the background. Those are like 10th magnitude, 12th magnitude field stars. Wouldn't it be nice though, if we didn't have to wait months and be, or, or build a very big telescope? So on this plot already, you can maybe see the answer. Alpha Cen A and Alpha Cen B are both bright. If we forget about our reference stars and we just measure the angle between the A and B, both of them are in the bright limit here. We can, uh, we can recover signals very quickly. So this motivated the idea of um, binary star narrow angle astrometry. We don't try and measure the wobble. We just try and measure the, how one star is separated from the other one. Um, so the binary separation, and we witness that as a function of time. And if there's a planet, there'll be a tiny perturbation on that binary star separation. It's a very simple measurement. But it only works on binary stars. It won't work in, if there's a, just a field star. So I've taken the previous plot and thrown away all the stars that are unsuitable because they're not binaries. Most of them are not binaries, so we lose a lot of very... Um, sort of favorable systems that we'd otherwise like to look at, like Tau Ceti and the famous exoplanet, you know, candidate systems. But Alpha Cen is a binary. It's a beautiful binary. So the nearest best candidate object is still riding high here. It's still um, eminently uh, achievable. So um, I won't sort of labor this, but this narrow angle astrometry is kind of like a new way. This was the idea I threw out into this conference that, that got this whole thing rolling. We, we just witnessed the binary separation over time. But that comes with a catch. If you're going to measure that, you now have to fly something on your spacecraft that you use as a ruler. Um, you can't just rely on a field of background stars to form your ruler. You've got to actually fly a physical object. 
And I'll show you how insanely difficult this is. For reasons that you'll become apparent later, this is a kind of a typical science data frame from my mission. This is what a data frame would look like. This is a picture of a star, an image of a star recovered. It's got some complexity to it, but that's because we have a clever optical system. Um, but this is what you would see if you flew a camera up and uh, put it in orbit and started taking data. That's an image of the star. This is the central pixel of that image. These are the grain boundaries of the crystal structure at a high magnification. And this is the crystal structure of silicon atoms as they would appear in the lattice on your detector. Um, those are those atoms. And that little red circle is the deflection you would get over a one year period of the star being tugged around on your detector if your detector was perfectly still. So we need to register motions of the image on our sensor that are much smaller than the atomic spacing of the atoms that comprise that sensor. Um, so I should never include this slide in my talks because at this point everybody gives up and says this can't be done. Um, so I'm gonna enlist the help of my daughter at this point to illustrate a cool piece of optics that we came up with to try and achieve this crazy measurement. Um, this is a layer and if I wanna measure the height of something but I'm forced to do so in an optical system, um, if the optical system's perfect, I can just measure the size of the image. But our problem is that the optical system is very, very far from imperfect. It's uh, distorted to the point that we have thousands of times larger errors arising from the optical system than the precision we need in the measurement. But if I got my daughter to hold that ruler, then the image of the ruler would be distorted in an identical way to the image of the object I want to measure. And I could still, this, this puts the error and um, the error and the measurement system now have common mode errors. So I would still get a preserved measurement of the height of my daughter if she held the ruler out in front of her. Um, so this kind of idea of making the errors common mode with the optical system, um, results in a system like this. So we can actually implement this. If we have perfect optics, um, then we can just measure the angular separation of a binary star, but instead we have imperfect optics. So the equivalent of putting the ruler out in front of the optics is we put a diffraction grating in front of the optics. That causes the star to break into side lobes, but we have a binary star. So we have side lobes from both components. Now, what we do, instead of trying to measure the separation here between the blue and the green star, we simply witness the fact that those two side lobes lie at the same location. If we now pass the same uh, configuration with imperfect optics, the distorted field will have a poor measurement or a contaminated measurement of the separation between the green and the blue star. But those two side lobes will remain stuck together. So that witnessing those side lobes being stuck together gives us a measurement of the separation of that binary. Those two side lobes will only be separated from each other if the actual binary changes. So we've taken all of the errors in our imperfect optics and we've measured them with a ruler consisting of the diffraction grading out at the front entrance pupil. So here's kind of how that would look. We have one star which makes a fancy diffraction pattern with lots of side lobes. A binary star will replicate that pattern. Let's now just witness those locations where just by chance two of those side lobes lie near each other and for convenience we'll throw the others away to make the field a bit cleaner. Here's what optical errors look like. When we distort the field through thermal drifts and errors in the optics, everything will move but those side lobes will just say stuck together. On the other hand, if we instead witness a real science signal, it looks quite different. That will, the two side lobes, which are next to each other, will now waggle with respect to each other. So there's kind of like a very different signature coming through the system. Our initial um, proposal to do this was to use a mask which had opaque uh, blocked most of the pupil and, and left transparent regions to make this complicated ruler in essence. So it, 
the diffraction pattern from the egg-shaped mask you see on the left is given to the right there. It's that kind of flowery pattern. So the basic idea is that rather than measuring the separation of the binary by counting the pixels between the cores, we actually count the fringes between the cores. Because if we count the separation using fringes, then if the telescope distorts, the fringes will distort. The ruler has changed according to the error and the measurement's still preserved. It contains none of that error that you introduce with an optical aberration. So we've made the errors common mode with our signal. Um, an immediate problem with this was that in actual fact, there's not enough light in this diffractive ruler. Most of the starlight still lands in the cores. What you see here is at a very strong log stretch. This is the reality at a linear stretch. So we don't have enough light in our ruler. We're making a, we're making a ruler out of starlight with which to measure the angle on the sky. So I'm going to warn everyone in advance. I'm going to go through some fairly hairy Fourier uh, optics coming up. There's some really clever ideas here. Um, what we did instead of that opaque mask is we actually use a phase mask, which is able to diffract more of the starlight out into that ruler that we need. And we make that mask by carving little steps in the primary. So where you see black and white up on the top here, you are to understand that the mirror has been carved down or milled down by half a wave step. So by putting the light out of phase with itself, it turns out you can really make a titanically scrubby point spread function. So it's easy to really mess up. What we want to do here is make the messiest possible image of the star. So we want the worst possible camera. And in fact, we, we, got, we went down and clinical with this. We got beautifully bad point spread functions um, using these tri-spirals that are able to throw light out of the core into these beautiful um, pattern structures. So now when we look at the binary star, we'd see something like this, these overlapping patterns. In actual fact, um, this has a number of advantages. It spreads the starlight over many pixels, giving you resistance against noise. Um, and it removes these optical errors that I talked about uh, from the optical train. And then we found another flaw, a really serious flaw in our design. And that is that the fringes um, depend on the wavelength of the starlight. And we've just been assuming till this point that the wavelength of stars stay put, but of course stars change, stars boil around, they change in temperature. So when the star changes temperature, the fringes, um, the fringes will change as well because the fringes are proportional to the wavelength of the light as well as the geometry of the ruler. We were just focused on keeping the ruler stable, but we can't keep the star stable. So we had to introduce a second system and I'm maybe going to go a little fast here. I apologize. In addition to the core where we diffract the starlight, we also diffract light out into little spectra in the corners of the chip. That enables us to monitor the stellar temperature at the same time as we monitor. So we can, we can find what the wavelength is at each point in time and we can understand what the star's doing, then we can calibrate our plate scale. Um, and we showed we could kind of sort of do this, but there was a tension in our designs. There's a problem and it looked really difficult to make this work. So in order to make our measurement in the core, where we're trying to find the binary separation of our binary star, we need this very messy point spread function and we've achieved that. But then in order to measure the spectra, we make these spectral side lobes out in the sides of the chip. And because we've got this messy function in the core, we have a very messy side lobe because it just replicates the function of the core. Um, and so we just made the world's worst spectrometer because uh, our slit function here, if you know spectrometry, our slit function is terrible. It's a big blurry disk. Um, and then we came up with, uh, the, the team came up with this beautiful genius solution where it turns out, in fact, if you flip the phase of the um, grating, every time it crosses one of these boundaries between on the primary mirror where the phase flips, you can kind of have this magical solution where you have your cake and eat it too. You can have this perfectly messy point spread function in the core and then these side lobes collapse to be perfectly diffraction limited airy disks. So we can have 
this ideal uh, grading function in the, in the side where we get the stellar spectrum and we get this very messy core where we extract the astrometry. Um, uh, a really a bright student working with me uh, improved on these designs, Louis Dedois' work. Uh, he did these beautiful uh, simulations where he got much better, um, much better outcomes from a, um, an algorithm that optimized this pupil. And uh, in fact, we've made these now. We've had some of them made in the um, optical fabrication. Uh, so this is a, a, an optic that is being viewed here against my computer screen through my sunglasses. Um, and that's not a stunt. That's because if, if you look at it without cross polarizers, this, uh, it simply looks like a, a flat piece of glass with nothing on it. But through polarized filters, you can see the structure that's been engraved on there. And you can see Louis's design here. It's got the cross hatching where we have the, um, the side lobes that generate the side lobes. And it's got the primary pattern that generates the messy point spread function in the core. Um, it's beautiful technology. If anybody's interested in it, it it's, it's almost achromatic. It works from 400 nanometers out to 600 nanometers and gives you half a wave step everywhere. It's wonderful. So we put this into an optical simulation, or, sorry, an optical test bed and actually took real data with it. And this is the, uh, the theoretical model, what we are trying to achieve. And you can see our data is just beautiful. We, we basically deliver exactly the point spread function we were hoping to. And we can see these lovely side lobes. You can even see going blue to red here in this um, illuminated here with a, a sort of a, a somewhat broadband source. So um, the present status of this project is that we are about to fly. Um, there's a 2019 date that I left in here. This was our, our original launch date. Um, obviously it didn't launch in 2019. This program got held up by various paperwork issues, but uh, it's all ready to fly. Um, it's Chris Betters, uh, shout out to Chris here. He's been uh, fantastic getting this thing to a reality. Um, but it's a small part of a, a 3U CubeSat. So it's just a, a very small, more or less pathfinder. Um, and we hope to fly that later this year. Just really just to demonstrate the technology in space. So after Tiny Toll comes, uh, well, it's called Tollerboy for reasons I, I won't go into, but uh, we're actually soliciting a new name. So if anybody wants to... Um, send in a name, I'm happy to consider it. This, was, this is a working name for now, it's just a kind of a, a diminutive of Toleman. Uh, so this is funded by Breakthrough Watch. We're still trying to nail down the contract to get the final um, agreement over the funding, but it will be about a 10 centimeter pathfinder uh, with a number of international partners. We hope to fly that in about two years and it'll have uh, a three year mission. And we believe this, satellite will have enough sensitivity to find Earth planets around Alpha Sen. That's our, that's our goal. Um, it's meant to be part of a wider program, which leads to the full Toleman mission. Um, we presently have a proposal in at JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA in uh, California, for a $20 million cap mission to fund Toleman, uh, which would be something around a 20 or 30 centimeter aperture mission. Uh, and we have a number of international partners who are super keen on this. Um, so just to wrap up, um, our goal is to find uh, Earth mass planets around Alpha Cent A and B. There are two habitable zones to go for, so twice the fun. Um, it's already known that there can't be gas giants, which is a good thing because the gas giants might otherwise throw uh, an Earth mass planet out. So uh, nobody really has any handle on whether or not there could be super Earths or below in the, either of these two habitable zones. Um, so this is simply a detection mission. It would simply give you a yes or no answer and some hints of, and some information about the likely orbit, but it would really require follow-up um, to characterize what it was you had found. So I think at this point, I'm gonna try and hand over to Boris um, that's okay. the Toleman mission, and just let me stop my screen share. I think we can all save questions till the end and take it away, Boris. 
Now, now that I've shown you where the planets are, you can get us there. Thanks, Peter. If we know that there is a planet, indeed, how can we characterize it better? Uh, Peter very clearly showed how incredibly difficult it is to image those planets from Earth. So can we get a better image? Can we get closer to it to get a better image? And this is where this uh, project comes in. Um, so uh, I'm working as part of the um, uh, Mission to Alpha Centauri Grand Challenge team, uh, which includes a whole bunch of researchers from across fields in the University of Sydney, including uh, materials researchers, space researchers, uh, photonics people, astronomers, uh, mechanics specialists, all of that. And we are funded by the, uh, by the school's uh, Grand Challenge uh, scheme. But we also work in close collaboration with the Breakthrough Initiative that uh, is uh, doing this Starshot um, project on a much bigger scale, including what uh, Peter just discussed already, and many other projects. So the question is, oops, there we go. Can we get close enough to Proxima B to get a shot, uh, an actual photography of this, uh, uh, of, the, of a potential planet that might be there from close up? Um, and can we do so because the Starshot, uh, the, the Breakthrough Initiative is funded by a Russian billionaire. He wants to have to see that before he dies. So he wants to do that within a lifetime. So um, can we do that within our lifetime? Can we get to Proxima Centauri, uh, sorry, well, Centauri B in about four, sorry, um, within our lifetime? So the distance is about 4.2 light years. Our lifetime, well, once we built the spacecraft, which will take a while, uh, we need to get there within about 20 years. And so if you divide the distance of 4.2 light years by 20 years, you get that you need to travel about 20% the speed of light. Um, that's very hard. And as you know, to accelerate um, an object, well, the force needs to be proportional to the mass. The bigger the mass of the object, the stronger the force is, the higher the energy you need to uh, propulse an object. So we're talking about a spacecraft that is as light as possible. And people think, um, and that's still very much debated, that potentially a probe of a single gram could have all the electronics and everything required to send back an image um, of a planet uh, from four light years away. Um, you can imagine that even that, just sending back information is a humongous problem, which I will not go into today. But let's look at that. We have a probe that is about one gram that we need to propel to 20% of the speed of light. Well, we can calculate the kinetic energy. Technically, we need to take into account the uh, relativistic correction to the kinetic energy, but it turns out the correction, even at 20% of the speed of light, is actually quite small. And we can use the formula that we know and love, one half of mv squared. And if we put the 20% of the speed of light there with one gram mass, we get uh, 1.8 times 10 to the 12 joules. So we need to uh, give that spacecraft two terajoules of energy so it can go at 20% the speed of light. Two terajoules of energy, how much is that really? Well, that is the same kinetic energy as that of a fully laden, laden um, aircraft carrier going at more than 500 kilometers an hour. It's a huge amount of energy. Im imagine you get that crashing into a wall. It would be a, a humongous disaster. In fact, another point of comparison perhaps is um, how much energy is in an atomic um, uh, uh, bomb. Uh, a small atomic bomb, about 0.5 kiloton TNT equivalent, has the same energy, is releasing the same energy that is required for the space probe. So basically you need to propel it with a nuclear weapon. Of course that would be rather destructive, so we need better things. Another way of looking at it is comparing it to the rest mass energy. If we take one gram of matter, uh, the rest mass energy, mc squared, is 90 terajoules. So that maybe that looks feasible now. If we have the mass of uh, 90 terajoules, well, we have 90 terajoules to play with. Can we convert perhaps some of that mass into energy to propel the spacecraft? Well, uh, we need 2% of the rest mass to be converted to energy to get enough energy to propel the spacecraft. Um, however, the problem is that known ways of producing energy uh, the, with the highest uh, energy density that we know, for example, uh, nuclear uh, fission for nuclear reactors, only convert 0.1% of the reactive mass into energy. So even if the entire spacecraft was made out of plutonium and you could extract all of the energy of it, you would only get to a fraction of the speed that you need. Nuclear fusion, which I remind you is far from being mastered on Earth, gives a slightly better ratio of about 0.5% of the rest mass converted to energy, and that too is not enough. So the main conclusion from that is that however, whatever process we use to propel the craft, 
the energy cannot come from the craft itself. The, the craft just cannot carry enough energy uh, to propel itself. So it can't be a rocket. It needs to be something else. The energy must be brought to the spacecraft from outside. We can't rely on the spacecraft itself to carry the energy from the outside. So conclusion, the spacecraft must be as light as possible because the energy scales with mass. The energy required is huge. It's of the order of a nuclear weapon and the energy must be brought from not the spacecraft itself, but from outside. So all these mean that basically we're left with something like that. We have a sail, which is uh, uh, just a reflector basically attached to a probe and the total has a mass of a few grams, maybe a gram, maybe two grams, details we don't know yet. And all that is propelled from energy brought from Earth itself. And the only way we know really how to carry energy on that distances is to use a laser beam. So we have a directed energy beam or a laser beam directed into space onto a sail. The photons from the laser go onto the uh, sail, get reflected. Each photon carries some momentum. The reflection gives momentum to the sail in the sail is propelled. So that's really the idea how we can get a craft to the next star uh, within our lifetimes. Now, of course, it's um, easier said than done. Um, for the start, the laser beam diffracts. So rather than having a nice little beam like that, uh, that is all straight, it looks more something like this. So that means that the further you are away, the, the uh, smaller the intensity is, the bigger the energy is spread. So you want to have a cell that is as big as possible so that it can catch as much light as possible and keep getting propelled. So if you have one gram of matter, well, and you need some good reflection to get this momentum uh, um, uh, transferred to the cell, you need to get a good reflectance and to get a good reflector, you need some matter. You can't just do it with a single layer of atoms. You need a few hundred layers of atoms. In fact, ideally a few microns in thickness. And so if you divide the mass of one gram divided by the, uh, the, the mass of a thickness of about a micron of atoms, you get that the surface area is going to be of order 10 square meters or so. One to 10 square meters, say, for the surface area of the sail. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Something extremely thin, extremely, well, as large as possible and as light as possible. Um, but that's not the only problem. Once the, start, the even 10 square meters start moving, well, the further away you are, the less um, intensity you have because the laser beam diffracts. So what you really want is to have the laser beam that is focused on the sail dynamically with distance so that all the energy remains on the sail at all times. So let's go through the numbers for that. Well, let's say we accelerate our sail with uh, an acceleration of 20,000 G. So 20,000 times the uh, acceleration you feel from Earth's gravity on the surface. Uh, or roughly 200,000 meters per uh, square, sorry, meters per second square. Um, why that number? Well, we need a large number, as we'll see in a second, and that's about what materials can sustain. They can sustain a bit more, it could be 60,000, but it's of order tens of thousands of G. So if we have an acceleration of 20,000 G, and we want to get to 0.2 of the speed of light, well, we can simply divide the final velocity by the acceleration to get the acceleration time, which gives us a few minutes of acceleration, and also the acceleration length, 10 to the 10 meters, as it turns out, or 0.1 astronomical unit. One astronomical unit is the distance between Earth and the Sun. So we need to uh, accelerate the sail over a distance that is one tenth between us and the Sun. Maybe not necessarily in that direction, but that's the distance. So it's a huge distance in space that we need to accelerate the laser beam on. That means we, uh, sorry, the sail on. That means we need to be able to focus the laser beam on that sail over a distance of 10 to the 10 meters or 10 million kilometers. Well, you can do the math for the uh, diffractive optics that is required for that. And uh, you end up needing a, kil a laser that is a kilometer in diameter. That is a laser mirror that is a kilometer in diameter, a single mirror, one kilometer wide. Can you imagine how big that is and how expensive that would be? You can also calculate that the power required, remember we need two terajoules. Well, if you accelerate over several minutes, you divide the, the energy divided by the time over which you accelerate, that means the power of the laser is gonna need to be about tens of gigawatts, or in fact, more like a hundred gigawatts, given that there's a, some uh, inevitable inefficiencies. So you need a hundred gigawatt laser that is one kilometer in diameter. It sounds impossible, 
Um, it's not impossible. It's just extremely expensive. And with current state of the technology, it would probably kill cost several trillion dollars. So that's a very, very large number. Um, but that's not all of it. So once we have the laser, imagine we have this trillion dollar laser. We send it to the light cell, um, which we know needs to be as light and thin as possible and has a, have a higher reflectance. Well, some of that laser beam, however reflective that cell is, will be absorbed. And if some of that laser beam is absorbed, if some of the 100 gigawatts on this micron thin cell is absorbed, the cell will heat up. And if it heats up too much, well, it will melt. It will vaporize even, in fact, with that kind of power. Remember, this is the, power, the energy of uh, a nuclear weapon. So it definitely has a potential of vaporizing this cell. So we need some, a cell that has extremely low absorption. And that, um, from the outset, eliminates all uh, metals. You can't use a reflective uh, mirror as we know it. We can't use a silver or gold film. That will just vaporize instantly because there is a, a several percent uh, uh, reflection or a fraction of a percent reflection at best. So that means you'll have to have some transparent mirror. We'll discuss how we can do that in a, in a few slides. But also some of that, even with the most transparent material on earth, some of the power will be absorbed and the cell will heat up. So we need to cool down that cell. But how do you cool down something in space? You're in vacuum. So you can't rely on convection or, or, or conduction. The only thing that will emit um, uh, um, heat, the only thing that will carry away heat is radiation itself. So you need to design it, the cell so that it has a high emissivity in the infrared. So it needs to reflect perfectly and absorb next to nothing at the laser wavelengths. And in the longer infrared, it needs to emit as much as possible so that it can cool down. Um, so that means that we need to optimize the photonic properties. We need to play around with the cell materials and structures so that we can maximize the reflectance, minimize the absorptance, at the laser wavelength and maximize the emissivity in the infrared. So how can we do that? Well, first of all, um, we need to pick the right materials. As I said before, the lowest absorption uh, possible, that already leads you towards uh, glasses, some glasses, some crystals uh, with very, very low absorption. Um, then if you have a single layer of the material, well, you get a certain reflection, you can calculate it from the Fresnel reflection, but because it's a transparent material, it will be quite a small reflection. So to increase the reflectivity, what you can do is add uh, multiple layers of it. So if we have a single layer, like here on the right, um, and a little laser coming in, uh, the laser is a wave, it comes in, um, there is a, some part of the uh, beam is transmitted because it's, tra it's transparent materials, picture a layer of glass, and some of it is reflected. If you now put a second layer a bit further away of the same material, well, again, some of that light will go through, but some of it, whoops, will get reflected. And if you get the distance between the two layers of glass just right, the reflected wave from the second layer of glass will interfere constructively with the, the, um, the wave from the first layer of glass and you get an enhanced reflection back to the laser, which is where you get then the biggest momentum transfer towards the cell. Um, and conversely, you can get it so that the uh, transmitted wave uh, interferes destructively. And so basically you can, the more layers you get, the more you can increase the reflection and you can get uh, closer to 99.9 reflection if you really want it um, with uh, such multi-layer stacks. In fact, using the same tricks, you can also, with multiple layers, you can increase the uh, absorption or the emissivity. Of course, we don't want to increase the absorption of the laser wavelengths, but we want to increase the, uh, the emissivity at a longer wavelengths, let's say 10 microns, where much of the radiation heat is generated at room temperature. Um, and because of Kirchhoff's law, equivalence between absorption and emissivity, if we can um, play with the absorption, we can play with the emissivity. So um, by playing around with the geometry and the materials, we can optimize the cell to do just what we want it to do. Um, but there's another problem, and that is a problem of stability. If your cell is in the middle of the laser beam, perfectly aligned, then all the forces are symmetrically distributed on the cell and the cell will be propelled forward um, it's very nicely. However, if the cell is only slightly off the beam, then the distribution of forces is no longer uniform. And in fact, there might be a part of the cell that is outside the beam where there's no force at all. So suddenly there will be a torque. And once the torque plays, well, the cell will rotate. And that's even worse because once the cell rotates, the light will be deflected in the direction. It will give some momentum at an angle. 
and the cell will be uh, going off path out of the laser beam and will be lost forever. So we need to somehow stabilize the cell both to remain within the beam and to remain perpendicular to the beam at all times. And this is where more complicated uh, photonic structures come in, such as metamaterials and photonic crystals that can not only increase the reflection and increase emissivities, and similar to multilayered um, uh, stacks can do, uh, but they can also direct the light in certain direction, um, and so they can control the refraction and the reflection in certain directions, um, and by doing clever tricks on where the light gets refracted where on the cell, you can uh, force the cell to remain within the laser beam and remain stable. All that using photonics. So um, all these seem to be crazy ideas. You know, we need terajoules of energy. We need kilometer lasers. We need materials that absorb next to nothing. All that seems uh, very impossible. But here's another crazy idea that is perhaps even more crazy than anything else. Um, I said we need a one kilometer laser just because the laser beam diffracts. Well, what if instead of having a one kilometer laser, we have a somewhat smaller laser, maybe only 100 meter. That sounds a lot more feasible. It's, it's only borderline bigger than, than current extra large, very large telescopes or whatever they call these days. Um, and that is, what if we put a small, well-timed explosive device in the beam of the path? Maybe only a kilogram of matter that explodes. When it explodes, it, in, it releases gas, gas expanding very rapidly, and gas refracts light. So you get this kilometer wide gas cloud of gas. And in fact, some of that gas would be uh, ionized, so it's a plasma. And that can refract light by itself. So can we perhaps, by putting the right ch explosive charge well designed at the right point and, 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 and detonated at the right moment, focus the beam back on uh, the sail using a much smaller laser from Earth? That would be a much more cost effective uh, proposition. Whether we can do that or not, we have no idea. And this is where you come in. This is where we need students to help us with all those projects. So um, among the projects that we're looking at in Sydney are related to the Starship project. And, and I should say, this is a, a worldwide initiative. There's many people around the world working on all the aspects of this mission. Uh, we are only working on the cell uh, itself in Sydney. Well, sorry, this group only works on the cell itself. Uh, Peter works on other aspects of it. Um, and so we're looking at the mechanical stability. How can we stabilize the cell in the beam? Uh, we're looking at the photonic design. How can we increase the reflectance? How can we improve the thermal management? How can we uh, make the, uh, design the cell so that it remains stably within uh, the cell? How can we design it so that it doesn't get all wobbly, so it's get, it stays nice and, and, uh, and taut and flat? Remember, this is very thin, so it's more like sending glad wrap into space. Um, and we're also looking at this crazy idea of using a rarefied gas or plasma as a space lens to help with the laser beam. We're also looking at um, what happens if the cell is charged. And you might ask, why would, an electric, why would it be charged in space? Well, because different atoms have different um, uh, velocity because of the Boltzmann distribution uh, in the outer atmosphere, in the very outer atmosphere, um, uh, when, when, when you launch things, they tend to charge up just because of different velocities of different ions. And so if the, charge, if the cell is charged itself, then suddenly you have a, a, a charged object traveling at relativistic speeds. That does all sorts of things, like emitting all sorts of radiation, and perhaps would be very detrimental to the project. We don't know that. And all these things we need to explore. Um, so if you're keen on doing a project with us, that's the kind of topics you can work on. And uh, we have projects going from undergrad all the way to a PhD. Um, so just ask us. And on a final note, of course, Starshot is extremely ambitious. We're looking at doing things that have never been done before on a scale that are just unbelievable, you know, trillion dollar lasers. Um, and perhaps it will never happen. I mean, we got to be realistic about that. Uh, humanity has other issues than to deal with sending probes to space. Maybe the money is well better spent elsewhere. But on the way, we will learn a lot of physics and uh, we will probably derive methods to send uh, probes to closer planets on a much faster scale than to other planets, uh, than, sorry, than to ex, um, extra uh, solar uh, planets, exoplanets. So there's a lot more, there's a lot of more realistic applications as well. And there's certainly a lot of uh, interesting physics to be learned along the way. And that's the end of my talk. So I think we'll start taking questions. Yeah, thank you both for very uh, for sharing very exciting research. Uh, and now we have time for questions, please.
I would like to encourage especially students to, uh, to ask the questions. Now you either can uh, raise a hand or unmute the mic and speak or, or put your question in the chat room. Uh, I have a question for Peter. Ronik is here. Hey, Ron. Yes, please. Hi there. Um, your, uh, your, uh, your, your, your diffraction grating that's making this side low pattern has got a lot of circular symmetry to it. As I was listening to your talk, great talk, uh, I'm thinking your, your binary is two objects uh, at, a, at an angle which you know. So why do you have circular symmetry? Why don't you have a set of side lobes which are designed for one orientation? Because that would be more efficient, I think. Yes, no, that's exactly correct. Um, in essence, we might do that, um, partly because we don't yet trust that we have enough control over spacecraft role. So, so what Ron is saying is that it's essentially the measurement is a 1D measurement. And in the end, if we make this measurement properly, all we have recovered is the scalar separation between the binary. We, we have no knowledge. We witnessed the binary doing this. That's great. That's a planet. But we have no knowledge if the binary is doing this. And if there's a, in fact, if there's a planet in a polar orbit around one, I hope people can see me. If there's a planet in a polar orbit around one of the stars, then that star will wobble that way. And we'll never see that planet. We only see a planet if it drags the binary along the axis of its separation. So what Ron's saying is that our ruler only needs gray, like you don't need a ruler with, uh, with tick marks at all orientations. We only need a ruler with tick marks along one axis and not the other axis. And in fact, we could spend our starlight, we could design custom design a pupil. Um, it, it's a good point. It's a good question. Uh, we may end up doing that. Uh, in fact, an elliptical mirror is something you could consider because then you get a better diffraction limit for the same budget because you get a longer mirror one way than the other and then you get a, um, a more uh, yeah, better grab on the point spread function in the direction you care about. So you would fly that mirror with the long axis along the binary. Um, <clears throat> so the short answer is we're designing it to be safe against spacecraft roles so that it can work at any roll angle. Um, and in that case, you need a circular asymmetric pattern. But you're right, we, we, we're grabbing information in the orthogonal direction that we, we can't possibly use. All right, do we have other questions? Maybe I, I'll ask, uh, start with Boris. Uh, look, uh, this project looks like to me, you know, the you are involved in is, is very multi multidisciplinary. You talked a lot of physics there and the engineering and, and things like that. So what is the particular thing you are doing within this project? Can you briefly explain? Well, my, my background is in photonics. Um, so I'm really looking at the photonics part of that, uh, the uh, increasing the reflectivity, increasing the emissivity, uh, the thermal management, um, and increasing the stability within the beam. That's what I work on with, uh, with Martin de Sturg, with Mohamed Rafat, uh, with Mike Wheatland as well. Right. And uh, maybe, okay, so here is a questions. So Quincy asking, Boris, what are the ways students can get involved in photonic design for thermal management? Thermal management? So that's a good question. Um, in fact, in semester one, we already had a few TSP students in second year uh, working on exactly that, or partly working on exactly that. And um, we worked on, uh, so one of the students uh, wrote a code to uh, simulate the reflection from multi-layer stacks. Um, and now we're extending it also to include the thermal management and, and the emissivity uh, properties. And, and this is physics that is, um, I mean, this is a second year uh, student who did that. So it, it wasn't, you know, he, he got around the physics of that pretty rapidly without even having done any advanced electromagnetism or anything like that. 
So you can really give, do contributions at an undergrad level already. I mean, the, the, the results from his work will be published. Okay. Do we have other questions? Yeah, if not, I'll, I'll ask another question about the timeline. So it looks like, uh, you know, if you put everything together, uh, it's very, very complex and complicated and uh, project. Uh, so, and, and, and the people wanted to get uh, in a lifetime, their lifetime. So what are the timelines of these projects? So the, my understanding is that, Peter, you start looking for exoplanets first, um, and but it's kind uh, of all happening at the same time, isn't it? Yeah, it's parallel. But uh, is uh, w what are the timelines, for example, for Peter uh, finding the the? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a piece of um, it's a fairly complicated terrain, and in fact, the Breakthrough Foundation funds a lot of things that are Starshot's just one of their initiatives. In fact, they also fund uh, radio searches for coherent signals or, or ordered signals. Um, the reboot of the kind of SETI program. And in fact, the thing I'm doing, which is to look for planets, predates Starshot. So they, they had a thing called Breakthrough Watch, um, as in go out and watch for things. Um, Breakthrough Watch is, a, is an initiative which, in fact, was the first thing that was uh, the, the billionaire decided to fund before any of the um, Listen or um, Starshot. Uh, so, Watch has already delivered results. There's already been a campaign uh, on the European uh, VLT telescopes in Chile that has, um, when my white paper went in, it was selected along with one other in, for funding by the foundation. The other one was a piece of instrumentation on a ground-based telescope that's already been built and taken on sky. So that's already produced results. Uh, it uses a different technology. It actually uses direct imaging to try and find planets. Um, so you, yeah, watch this space. You might even see uh, announcements from them coming up in the next weeks. So it's already ongoing. They're already looking for planets. Um, my mission, I mean, it's been pretty heavily impacted by COVID. Supply chains have all been stopped. It's been very hard to get the funding nailed down. Lots of different real world hurdles. Um, we're hoping to launch something within a couple of years of getting funded. Um, Starshot, I think, I mean, Boris kind of put this diplomatically, but it's, it's a visionary endeavor off into the future. It's very different in nature from the thing I'm doing. I think what, you know, the thing I'm doing is there's nothing, you know, there are no kind of unknown unknowns. There's no impossibles there. It's, it's attainable technologies. It should all work. Um, it, the, the, the challenge I have is I'm doing it for a, Sounds like a few million dollars is a lot of money, but if you are conversant with people who regularly fly missions from NASA or ESA, those guys don't roll out of bed for like less than, you know, $20 million is a very, very small envelope for them. And um, similar things to try and accomplish the same measurement have been costed at 50 million. So trying to do it for like five or whatever I'm at is, that's, that's the, the thing I'm doing is not doing a, Thing that's otherwise impossible. I'm doing something that's possible for 50 million for five. That's my kind of secret sauce. And for the Starshot project, project it, it really relies on the technology getting cheaper. It relies on Moore's law for lasers that every watt of power becomes half of the price within two years or so. And right now building a 100 gigawatt laser that is a kilometer wide is just, I mean, it's technologically possible. It's just no one would put the money in towards it. But in 20 years time, it might only cost, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and then or maybe only billions of dollars and billions of dollars is a kind of project on a grand scale, you know, the LHC uh, fusion reactors and so on. They're billion dollar projects. So it might be one of those. Yeah, thank you. Great. So we have a question from Anne Green uh, in the chat uh, to Peter. What complexity do you get if there are two plus planets around one of the stars? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a, a fairly uh, intuitive thing. It's, it's, it's largely the same as the kind of signals you get in radio velocity when you have more than one planet. Um, more than one planet will simply give 
uh, sinusoidal signatures at more than one um, period. So if there's a planet at one and a half years and another one at two years, then you will have two different excursions in the data at two different frequencies and you'll do your lomb scargle periodogram if everyone knows those. You just basically extract the frequencies. Um, one of the tricks I think I mentioned though is that we are, because we only measure one separation for two stars, we are actually blind to which star hosts the planet. Um, there's an ambiguity there. It could be either star. All we see is that the stars are getting dragged towards and away from each other. So, um, and we know the period, but we don't actually know which, like it might, you know, one, one star's heavier than the other. So it, it could be a more distant planet around the higher mass one or a closer planet around the lower mass one, and it would give the same signature. So that's why I say it's a discovery technology, not really giving you everything you want to know. All right, do you have more questions? I don't see hands and uh, nothing in the chat. So that means that it's time to close our session and thanks Peter and Boris again. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thanks Archul. Thanks Archul.